All right, welcome to another video in the machine learning for network and cloud engineers series. This is a brand new book that was released uh, last year, I think. And uh, so this is the cutting edge of uh, network engineering field, which nowadays is, is basically the same as cloud engineering, which you know, but requires different skills. So things keep getting more complicated over time. So uh, it's important to keep up to date with where the industry is going. And the industry is definitely going towards AI machine learning and, and never turning back from that. So the key takeaway from the last video was data representation is a fundamental pillar for any machine learning project. We need to make the right choices in order to make sure the inf the information our model contains is truly represented and the ML model can extract it. So we learned about various methods for doing that. We learned about the um, uh, one hot encoding method um, where so so the main thing we learned about is the difference between discrete categorical variables is this an image of a cat or a dog versus uh, continuous quantifiable numerical values is is this uh, stock price increasing or decreasing so categorical and nominal this is a big thing we learned about in the last video so um yeah so so you have to make sure that your the things you're you're analyzing translate into these this techniques you can't just put random data in and expect the machine models to be useful. So it's it's garbage in, garbage out. You have to know your data and you have to know certain things about the data. Are they, is your, is your data numeric and discrete where there will be, yes, there are numbers and the numbers are quantifiable with uh, magnitudes, but there's only a small range of numbers that, that are acceptable. For example, a OS version is this firm firmware number 1.12 uh, okay how many different versions of firmware are there that exist by this manufacturer there's only a discrete number there's only 10 and then from there which is the most recent version so there there's the type of data you use is absolutely essential so you have to have a understanding of the four main types of data that that's you know needs to be managed and transformed. So the first one is numeric and continuous data. The second one is numeric and discrete data. The third one is categorical versus numeric, um, and this is nominal data. Uh, this is um, which is which is discrete and, and the order doesn't matter. And then. Um, there's subcategories of that. And then the fourth category of data is uh, not listed. So yeah, I see I see one through three and I don't see a number four listed anywhere. So that's I don't think that's that's one for the for the author. I did I did honestly find this last one kind of difficult to follow along with, but I feel like uh, the key takeaway uh, takeaways I've, I'm pretty comfortable with. So we learned about uh, about the data that goes into a machine learning network and how important it is to have that data be valid and, and the techniques you can do to, to make that uh, data more valid. Um, we also learned about, I don't know if this was in the very last video, but we learned about methods for um, yeah, so we learned about decision trees. I think that was a video before. Then we learned about ensembles. Um, to, to, and these are about building uh, models, so like techniques for building models. So we learned about bagging, about um, boosting, 
and, and the big one of the biggest uh things is is xg bo boost it's the most powerful and flexible technique uh especially when you're doing competitions platforms like kaggle so so that's that's a big one <coughs> all right so moving on k nearest neighbors k and n this is a simple intuitive yet computationally intensive approach to classification it is frequently used to set a baseline for the accuracy that can be achieved compared to other methods some people will argue that this is not a machine learning classification algorithm Usually, machine learning algorithms, particularly in the context of supervised learning, will use some existing data set to train the model so that subsequent samples can be labeled. However, the model will encode the internal patterns that govern the classification. In KNN, there is no such encoding of the patterns. The classification of any new observation requires validation, always, against all existing samples, which is not very efficient. In that sense, there is no training process as such because there is no model. The principle behind KNN algorithm is to compute the distance between the observation we want to classify and every other observation in the data set. Then we will select the K nearest observations. Out of them, we will count how many belong to each different class. The class with the largest number of observations in that set will be the one in which we will classify our new observation. So now we have a graphic. I like to put the graphics into ChatGPT. Now we should have some uh, yeah, so, so I, put, I put the graphics so I can just continue the conversation. The image you've uploaded illustrates the use of the K-Nearest Neighbors KNN classification algorithm. This is a simple yet effective machine learning technique used for classification and regression tasks. Here's how it works, based on the diagram provided. Component scatterplot. The scatterplot on the left represents a data set with two features, the number of ports used, P, and the number of units loaded, U. Two types of switches are depicted, leaf switches, green diamonds, and spine switches, red diamonds. The new observation, blue square, is also shown. Classification. The right side shows how the KNN algorithm classifies this new observation. It involves the following steps. Identifying the K nearest neighbors to the new observation based on a distance metric, like Euclidean distance. Counting the number of neighbors belonging to each category, leaf or spine. Assigning the new observation to the category most common among its K nearest neighbors. K equals 5. The parameter, K, is set to 5, meaning the classification decision is based on the 5 closest neighbors to the new observation. Result. Among the 5 nearest neighbors, 4 are leaf switches and 1 is a spine switch. Consequently, the new observation is classified as leaf switch. Significance of the KNN algorithm simplicity and intuitiveness. KNN is easy to understand and implement, making it a good baseline algorithm for many classification problems. No training phase. Unlike many other algorithms, KNN does not require a training phase. It simply stores the data set, and learning happens at the time of prediction, making it a type of lazy learner. Versatility. It can be used for both classification and regression problems. Application networking. In the context of networking, KNN can be used to classify network devices based on their characteristics, such as traffic patterns, port usage, or other measurable features. Anomaly detection. It can help in identifying unusual patterns that deviate from established norms in network traffic. Limitation scalability. KNN can be computationally expensive and slow for large data sets because it requires computing the distance from each query point to all training examples. Cursive dimensionality. Its performance can degrade with high dimensional data because the distance between data points becomes less meaningful. The illustration you provided is a clear and practical example of applying KNN in a technological context, demonstrating how machine learning can be directly utilized to make decisions about the classification of network components. All right, so, uh, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm back. I, I misplaced my phone, so I was looking for it during that. Um, I was able to hear everything, but I was away from my microphone, so I wasn't able to speak. All right, so um, I guess I'm pretty happy with that. So number of VLANs used, we've got a new observation on there. So now we can we can classify whether it's a um, leaf switch or not. This algorithm is highly sensitive to the K value, and the result may vary depending on what we select. There is no specific method to select the value. A very small value will lead to very unstable decisions, and a very large value may include information too far away from our observation and be influenced by the presence of other classes. 
Also, the right K may depend on our observation because the density and location of observations will not be the same across all n-dimensional space. Try and error and evaluating several observations with different K values may give us a better perspective on the optimal one in each scenario. So there's, yeah, so I think, I think what this should say is trial and error and evaluating several observations. So, all right, so moving on to logistic regression. Despite its name, logistic regression is a classification algorithm, not a regression one. Logistic regression is the equivalent in classification to linear regression. In linear regression, we assumed that there was a line, a plane in n-dimensional, that best fit and predicted the values for our sample data set. In logistic regression, the assumption is that a line, a plane in n-dimensional, is the best way to separate our classes. If the number of classes is only two, we will refer to binomial logistic regression. If there are more classes, it will be multinomial logistic regression. In logistic regression, we effectively compute the probability that a particular observation belongs to a class. This is why it is effectively a regression problem. We will introduce, at this point, a few new mathematical functions. They are very relevant for the logistic regression itself, but also highly relevant for neural networks and all their associated architectures. I do not necessarily want you to understand them fully, but it is important that you can build at least some intuition around them and be aware of their existence. So, okay, so where uh, we've got this one here. Yeah, so now it's explaining them, but before it explains them, let's get the explanation from ChatGPT. So I'm gonna start a new chat for this. I'm gonna say, Help me be aware of the existence of the equation in the screenshot by explaining it in plain English and helping me build some intuition around it. The equation you provided is a fundamental concept for logistic regression, a statistical method used for modeling a binary outcome, where outcomes are typically labeled as 0 or 1. Let's break down the components of this equation. PPP, this is the probability of the occurrence of an event, like success, failure, yes, no, etc. P1 minus P, frac, P, 1P, 1 minus PP, this fraction is known as the odds of the event. It represents the ratio of the probability of the event occurring to the probability of it not occurring. Logic function, log it equals log, P1 minus P, X, log it equals log, left, frac, P, 1P, right, log it equals log, 1 minus PP. This is the natural logarithm, log base E, the odds. The transformation from probability to log, odds, is what characterizes logistic regression. The logic function is useful because it maps the probability of PPP, which is bounded between 0 and 1, to a range that extends from negative infinity to positive infinity, which can then be modeled using linear regression techniques. B0 plus B1 times X, B underscore O plus B underscore 1 times X, B0 plus B1 times X. This is a linear combination of predictors. Here, B0, B underscore 0, B0 is the intercept, and B1, B underscore 1, B1 is the coefficient for the predictor XXX. X, X. This linear form allows the incorporation of one or more predictors XXX X, X into the model, influencing the log, odds, of the probability of PPP. Intuition behind logistic regression, mapping to real world, think of XXX as any feature, like age, income, or other quantifiable factors, that can influence an outcome, like the likelihood of buying a house, having a disease, etc. The coefficients B0, B underscore 0, B0, and B1, B underscore 1, B1 are learned from data and tell you how much weight XXX carries in determining the outcome. From linear to logistic, while linear regression predicts values directly based on line of best fit, logistic regression must deal with outcomes that are probabilities, which are confined to 0, 1. The logic function, log of odds, helps by transforming the bounded probabilities into an unbounded line, which can be modeled like linear regression. Interpreting the model. Once you have a model, the coefficients b0, b underscore 0, b0, and b1, b underscore 1, b1 help you understand the influence of your predictors. For example, if b1, b underscore 1, b1 is positive, increasing xxx increases the log, odds, of ppp, and hence increases the probability of ppp. If b1, b underscore 1, b1 is negative, increasing xxx decreases the log, odds, of ppp, and hence decreases the probability of ppp. 
The logistic regression model thus offers a way to relate changes in predictor variables to changes in the probability of an event, encapsulating this relationship in a logistic sigmoid curve applied against PPP. All right, so I wish I could fix that so it doesn't say like PPP. Um, I, I do need to take a quick break, so I'm going to do that. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. I'm feeling good. So let's keep going. So we're going to get the book's explanation of this uh, of this now. So we've got the symbol P here, which is uh, listed twice here. Now we've got log. Um, log, um, just off the top of my head, uh, if I open up paint and I say, uh, so, so let's say uh, 4 squared. So we're going to go like this and say 4. Oops, uh, I just need the pencil. There we go. So if we do four squared equals 16. So now we can get, we can get, uh, we can blank out, you know, basic algebra says we can blank out some of these. So we can do X equals four squared and we know we know that this this symbol here means this times itself so four times four is 16. Um, we can x out the we can we can get rid of the other terms as well and uh and figure figure that out so uh one of the things we can do is do 16 equals x squared and now again, we know what this symbol means. This squared symbol means this x times x, uh, and we also know what the about the square root symbol. So we know that um, th that we can we can take the square root of both sides, and now we can get what x equals. So uh, if we if we take the square root of this side, then we cancel out the symbol. And then we, we end up with x equaling the square root of 16. And we know that the square root of 16 is 4 because 4 times 4 is 16. So now um, that brings us to, to the final thing we can do. So we've got 4. And now we've got an x. So, so what, what number here, how many times do we need to multiply 4 to to get 16 and we know the answer is two but how would you how would you write this in in kind of a how would you do the math to to figure that out so so you would take the log uh, um from what i understand so uh let me have a conversation with ChatGPT about this because this is kind of where i'm i'm shaky so Okay, so take a look at the screenshot. I'm trying to refresh in my memory what the LOG means in math, where you have LOG, open parentheses, close parentheses, and that's the log. You take the log of a number, and I think I'm on the right track. You can see in the screenshot the various mathematical operations I did. The last one where I say 16 equals x Sorry, the last one I say 16 equals 4 raised to an exponent of x. I think that's where this insight as to what a log is can come from. So help me finish out this thought and and show me how the LOG concept works in math. It seems like you're trying to understand the concept of logarithm, often written as log, using the equation you wrote involving the relationship between 16 and powers of 4. Let's break down the concept of logarithms and how it relates to your math problem. Understanding also, logarithms, the logarithm answers a question, to what power must a base be raised to produce a given number? In mathematical terms, log b, a, equals cx, log, underscore b, a, equals close to b, a, equals c means it, bc equals av caret c equals abc equals a. Here, b is the base, a is the given number. You're right in connecting logarithms with the expression where you equate 16 to 4 raised to the power x right. x. 16 equals 4 square x x. This scenario perfectly illustrates what logarithms are used for in mathematics. Thank you. Understanding the logarithm. The logarithm is the inverse operation to exponentiation. Specifically, right. if you have an equation like a b equals c, the logarithm allows you to find the value of b. Exactly. In logarithmic form, this equation would be written as log AC equals B. 
applying it to right. your equation. In your case, where 16 equals 4 okay, squared so, x, so, you're looking for what power powers must be raised to in order to get 16s. You can use logarithms to find x. x equals log 4 16. This equation states what power must 4 be raised to to produce 16. The logarithm base 4 of 16s gives you this exponent. Yeah. Calculating x to find x, you need to understand that 16 can be expressed as 4 square 2, since 4 times 4 equals 16 eighths. Therefore, 4s must be raised to the power of 2 to equal 16 eighths. 4 squared equals 16. So using the logarithm, x equals log 4, 16 equals 4, 4, 3 equals 2. Hence, x equals 2. This means that 16 equals 4 through x simplifies to 16 equals 4 squared, confirming that x equals 2. This is how the concept of logarithms is typically used in mathematics, to solve for exponents in equations of the form AB equals C, where A, A, B, and C are numbers, and A and C are known. The logarithm gives you a powerful tool to handle various scenarios involving exponential growth, decay, and many other applications where multiplication in one scale translates to addition in another, like in dB calculations in acoustics or pH calculations in chemistry. Okay, that, yeah, pretty happy with that. That voice is kind of, it's just, I wish you would talk a little faster, but like, it's, yeah, wow, I'm kind of impressed by that. So P equals the probability that the observation X belongs to category Y. B0 and B1 are the weights of the linear regression. If we manipulate and extract P, we obtain the following. So P equals one over one plus E to the negative Z equals sigmoid Z, where Z equals b0 plus b1 times x so let's plug that into the um chesh gpt uh now i okay there we go So Z looks precisely like the linear regression function we saw earlier in the book. Now we are taking that one and applying on top what we call the sigmoid function. Oh, and it's not uh, reading it out loud. I'm not sure why. Uh, let's uh, read it out loud. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma, c, sigma, c, sigma, c. The sigmoid function is crucial in various fields, particularly in statistics for logistic regression and in machine learning for binary classification problems. Function description, p equals 11 plus e minus c, p equals frac 1, 1 plus e caret, z, p equals 1 plus e minus c1. This function maps any real value number into the 0, 1 range. It is an S-shaped curve known as the logistic curve. Where z's comes from, in typical use, z's can be any linear combination of input variables. For example, in logistic regression, z's is often calculated as z equals b0 plus b1 by 1 plus b2 by 2 plus plus b n x n z equals b underscore o plus b underscore 1 x underscore 1 plus b underscore 2 x underscore 2 plus plus b underscore n x underscore n z equals b0 plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus plus b n x n where b0, b1, b n b underscore 0, b underscore 1, b underscore n b0, b1. You know what, I want to hear the other guy, um, because he reads those a, a bit better. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z. The sigmoid function is crucial in various fields, particularly in statistics for logistic regression and in machine learning for binary classification problems. Function description, p equals frac one, one plus eek my z. This function maps any real valued number into the zero one range. It is an S-shaped curve known as the logistic curve, where z comes from. In typical use, z can be any linear combination of input variables. For example, in logistic regression, this is often calculated as, z equals b1x1 plus b2x2 plus plus bnxn, where b0, b1, bn are parameters of the model, and x1, x2, xn are the input features. Characteristics of the sigmoid function. One, output range. The sigmoid function outputs a value between zero and one, which makes it particularly useful for applications like logistic regression, where the output can be interpreted as a probability. Two, nonlinear nature. The nonlinear nature allows the function to handle changes in probability in a nonlinear fashion, 
which is more realistic for many real-world processes that are not simply additive. 3. Gradient. The function has a well-defined gradient, which makes it suitable for gradient-based optimization methods, which are common in machine learning for finding the parameters, like B0, B1, Bn, that best fit the model to data. 4. Center at 0. The function is centered at 0, meaning sigma 0 equals 0 0.5. This symmetry simplifies the interpretation and application in binary classification problems. Used in machine learning, in a binary classification setting, the sigmoid function can help predict the probability that a given input point belongs to the class labeled as 1. Any real number, z, fed into the sigmoid function will return a value between 0 and 1, which can be interpreted as the probability of the input belonging to the positive class. Thresholds, like 0 0.5, are then applied to map this probability to a class label, 0 or 1. Interpretation in logistic regression. In logistic regression, this probability that the output is 1 given the inputs is modeled against the predictors or features of the data. The parameters or coefficients of these features, b1, b2, bn, are estimated from the data typically using maximum likelihood estimation. This setup allows for probability estimation based on input features and can handle various types of relationships, linear, interactions, nonlinear, depending on how Z is specified. Okay, so that's Cove. We've also got Ember, Sky, Breeze, and Juniper. Let's try Juniper because on this channel, I, uh, as uh, people uh, who've seen my... Yeah, this channel was based on, on learning... Uh, Juniper uh, technologies, so. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z. All right, so that, that's the voice for Juniper. Um, so we've got uh, other options as well. We've got, um, let's just, we got Breeze, Sky, Ember, and Cove. I'm pretty happy with just the original one. Uh, but let's hear let's hear Cove and then kind of not uh, continue to waste time. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z. I like this one the best. The formula yeah. you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly yeah. denoted as sigma z, sigma z. I like it to sound. The formula you provided is the definition robotic. of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z, sigma z. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function. All right. Um. Yeah, I okay. Well, let me hear some of the other ones. That's Breeze, and then we've got Sky, and then we've got Ember. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted. I don't think I don't think it's accurate. I don't think there was a difference there. The formula you provided yeah. is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z. The sigmoid function is crucial in various fields, particularly in statistics for logistic regression and in machine learning for binary classification problems. Function description, P equals. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function, commonly denoted as sigma z. The sigmoid function is crucial in various fields, particularly in statistics for logistic regression and in machine learning for binary classification problems. Function description. P equals frac 1, 1 plus e my z. This function maps any real valued number into the 0, 1 range. It is an S-shaped curve known as the logistic curve. The formula you provided is the definition of the sigmoid function. Com okay, I kind of I kinda like the, the other one. It's a bit more... Uh, I don't know. Let me just not get distracted here and keep on going. So the sigmoid function is essential in ML because it allows us to express a probability variable like P range between zero and one as expected to a probability value. So there we go, sigmoid function. It is a continuous and non-linear variable that allows us to model a probability function that needs to grow from zero to one across the spectrum of values on the x-axis. We will usually consider that when the probability is lower than 0 0.5, the value of 
y is 0. And when the probability is greater than or equal to 0 0.5, the value will be 1. We can visualize the model more graphically as follows. And let's see what ChatGPT has to say. The diagram you provided illustrates a simple neural network or logistic regression model using a single input xxx to predict an output probability p, y, p, y, p, y, via a sigmoid activation function, denoted as CCC in the diagram, which typically represents the sigmoid function. Let's break down each part of the diagram and its meaning, input xxx. This is the independent variable or feature based on which the prediction is made. Bias, p0, b underscore 0, b0, and weight, b1, b underscore 1, b1. The input xxx is multiplied by weight, b1, b underscore 1, b1, and a bias, b0, b underscore 0, b0 is added to this product. These are parameters that the model will learn. The bias B0B underscore 0B0 is like an intercept in linear regression, adjusting the output independently of the input. The weight B1B underscore 1B1 scales the input XXX, determining its influence on the output. Linear combination. The term B0 plus B1XB underscore O plus B underscore 1XB0 plus B1X represents a linear combination of the inputs and bias. This is the portion of the model that computes the weight of some of the inputs. Sigmoid function, CCC. This function takes a linear combination as input and transforms it through the sigmoid function, sigma, c, equals 11 plus e minus c, sigma, c, equals, frac, 1, 1 plus e caret, z, sigma, c, equals 1 plus e minus c1, where z equals b0 plus b1x, c equals b underscore o plus b underscore 1x, c equals b0 plus b1x. The sigmoid function outputs a value between 0 and 1, making it suitable for binary classification problems. It converts the linear input into a nonlinear output. Output, p, y, p, y, p, y. The output of the sigmoid function is interpreted as the probability p, y, p, y, p, y, that the dependent variable y, y, y equals 1 given the input xxx. Graph of sigmoid function, the curve shown in the diagram represents the typical S shape of a sigmoid function. The horizontal axis likely represents the value of the linear combination Zs, while the vertical axis shows the probability output P, Y, P, Y, P, Y from 0 to 1. The curve illustrates how changes in Zs, influenced by changes in XXX and the model parameters, affect the probability output in a nonlinear fashion. This setup is fundamental in logistic regression used for binary classification, where the goal is to predict the probability of an event, class 1, versus its non-occurrence, class O. In a neural network context, this same structure can be a single neuron or node, acting as a building block for more complex architectures. All right, so uh, moving on. The first part of the equation is a linear transformation. Sum and multiplication by weights uh, B0 and B1, followed by a nonlinear section based in this case on the sigmoid function. Somehow the sigmoid acts as a sort of activation function after the linear output of the weighted sum. This will result in computing the probability of the y value, the class or category predicted. This model and diagram will become much more meaningful in the sections ahead as you will learn that it is the basic cell of the modern machine learning industry. When the number of classes is higher than two, Instead of binary, we will use multi-normal logistic regression, which will leverages, I think there's an extra S there, that's not meant to be there, a different activation, which will, will leverage a different activation, a softmax function. This new function will ensure that the sum of the probabilities for the different categories is one. Then the selected category will be the one whose probability is higher. You will see applied examples of both sigmoid and softmax in some of the practical use cases in the last section of the book. Both sigmoid and softmax functions, soft max functions will be very frequently used when we build neural networks. All right, so the next section is support vector machines. I'm feeling good, so let's keep on going. Um, check the clock here. Should be able to do at least another half hour. Um, let me just check something quick and then, all right, I'm back. I just wanna be mindful of my messages. So I've got my uh, WhatsApp open there. Um, so moving on uh, uh, to support vector machines. Support vector machines, SVM, like other algorithms we have seen, decision trees, ensembles, neural networks, can be used both for classification and regression. We will focus in this section on SVM for classification. The algorithm I will explain is intended to differentiate between two classes. 
However, if there are more classes, the algorithm can be executed multiple times to differentiate between class A and the rest or run for all combinations of two classes. Either way, we can leverage binary classification to achieve a multi-class classification. The fundamental principle behind SVM, which we remember stands for support vector machines, is the search for the optimal hyperplane that can separate the two classes. We already saw that logistic regression somehow tries to achieve the same goal. The approach though is different in this case. In something vector machines, support vector machines, the algorithm will try to find the hyperplane that can support the two classes or that can separate the two classes while maximizing the distance from the plane to the closest samples from each class. In other words, it will find the largest minimum distance with each of the two classes. Other planes may still separate the two classes, but they will likely be more noise sensitive. A self-evident question at this point is... The diagram you uploaded is a visual representation of a machine learning concept in action, particularly used in the context of support vector machines, SVM, or other linear classifiers. It illustrates how a decision boundary or hyperplane is used to separate two classes of data points, which in this case are represented by spine switches and leaf switches. These terms can metaphorically describe categories in network hardware, such as different types of network switches based on their roles or characteristics. Let's break down the elements of this graph. Axes, the x-axis represents the number of ports used, PPP. The y-axis represents the number of LANs used, VVV. Data points, green diamonds represent leaf switches, likely indicating a specific type of network switch. Red squares represent spine switches, likely indicating another type of network switch with different characteristics or roles. Decision boundaries, hyperplanes, optimal hyperplane. This is the line that best separates the two classes of data points. In SVM and similar methods, the optimal hyperplane is the one that maximizes the margin between the closest points of each class. These closest points are known as support vectors. Suboptimal hyperplane. These lines represent other possible ways to separate the data that are not optimal. They either do not completely separate the classes or do so with a smaller margin between the classes. Interpretation and application. The purpose of the optimal hyperplane is to create a model that can accurately classify new data points as either spine switches or leaf switches based on their values of PPP and VVV. This can be useful in situations where decisions need to be made based on the capacity and usage of network ports and LANs. The suboptimal hyperplanes show potential but less effective decision boundaries, which could lead to misclassifications or less robust performance under varying data conditions. The graph provides a clear example of how data can be visually and mathematically separated into distinct categories using machine learning techniques, making it possible to automate and enhance decision-making processes based on patterns found in data. Okay, so now we can deal with uh, ones that are kind of a gray area um, by having these suboptimal hyperplanes, optimal hyperplanes, um, so a self-evident question at this point is that the example depicted in the picture looks convenient as the classes are very cleanly separated. However, how do we address scenarios where the classes may follow a different pattern and not be so easily linearly separated? S uh, such as here, we've got our spine switches here, leaf switches here. So we've got some leaf switches where um, there's not a lot of VLANs uh, assigned to them, but there's a lot of ports being used. And we've got another cluster of, of leaf switches where there are a ton of VLANs on them. So uh, actually in the real world, uh, well, actually no, because it would be it would be a spine. I was thinking like a, a layer three switch, but that would be more of a spine. And this sounds more like data center style architecture. So. Um, yeah, so how do we handle a situation where uh, it's, it's not so easy to separate which is which? Support vector machines allows you to use different types of transformations to the data using a type of function called kernels. Kernels can be used to create new dimensions in your n-dimensional space that will facilitate the differentiation of the classes more linearly. In other words, a transformation that converts a clearly nonlinear separation to a linear one, where SVM can apply its search mechanism for a hyperplane. Okay, so uh, this this is kind of complicated, so let's put it into ChatGPT, because that will help make it less complicated. <laughs> yeah.
The image you provided shows a clear progression in the application of machine learning techniques to classify data points, moving from a three-dimensional perspective to a simplified two-dimensional view. This illustrates a crucial concept in machine learning and data visualization called dimensionality reduction. Here's a breakdown of the steps and techniques displayed in your image. Three-dimensional representation. The first part of the image shows data points in a three-dimensional space where the axes are labeled as the number of VLANs used, VVV, the number of ports used, PPP, and a new variable, TTD. In this space, the two types of network switches, leaf switches, green diamonds, and spine switches, red squares, are plugged. The surfaces represent decision boundaries or regions where a model, like an SVM, has categorized or will categorize data points based on their coordinates in this three-dimensional space. Dimensionality reduction. The process shown might involve a technique such as principal component analysis, PCA, T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, t -SNE, or another method to reduce the number of dimensions while preserving as much information as possible. The right-hand side of the image shows the data transformed into a two-dimensional space while maintaining the distinction between the two types of switches. This is crucial for visualization, making complex data more interpretable and manageable. Reducing dimensions typically simplifies the computational demands and helps in visualizing patterns in data which are difficult to perceive in higher dimensions. Two-dimensional plot. After the dimensionality reduction, you see the data projected onto two dimensions, the number of ports used, PPP, and the number of VLANs used, PVV. The new variable, TDD, is no longer explicitly plotted but is implicitly part of the transformation that led to this view. This plot shows a clear grouping of the data points into two clusters, indicating effective classification despite the reduction in dimensions. Application in machine learning. In a practical scenario, such as in networking technology management, this type of analysis can help in automated decision making, predicting the type of switch needed based on user characteristics, or in optimizing network configurations. Dimensionality reduction not only aids in visualization but also in improving the performance of machine learning models by reducing the curse of dimensionality and noise in the data. This progression from a multidimensional space to a simplified two-dimensional overview is a powerful technique in data science, enhancing both the performance of analytical models and the ability to communicate complex phenomena in an accessible manner. Alright, so that sounds good. Moving on. As in this example, when we apply a specific kernel function to the input variables, it will project them into a new n plus 1 dimensional space in which there is a hyperplane that allows a clean linear differentiation of the classes. If we project back to the 2D plane, we can see that this hyperplane in the ordinal and dimensional space is not a plane but an elliptical shape which SVM would not have been able to compute by itself. How do you choose the proper kernel function to use? Frequently visualizing the data in 2D graphs may indicate how it looks and what to do to unwrap it. In any case, try and error, so the author means trial and error, will likely be inevitable and brute force. Remember, brute force is your friend. This is another example of how data transformation and feature engineering are fundamental. So we push to a model the optimal features for the model to do its job. So accuracy. What is accuracy exactly? It is time now to introduce a new concept. This applies to all classification techniques, but I want to touch upon this point before we dive into neural networks in the next section. We have somehow informally referred multiple times throughout the book to accuracy or said that this model is or is not accurate. Let's invest some time to more formally define what accuracy means or more precisely, what mechanisms we can use to evaluate if the goodness of a particular trained model, to, to evaluate the goodness of a particular trained model, and if accuracy is the right one. Evaluating the model is relevant both at the model training process phase and the production deployment phase. In the training, phase because it allows us to determine if we made the right choices or if we need to redefine some. At production, it is even more relevant because our choices may no longer be valid if the data changes, data drift, and we need to be aware if the model is still performing as expected. There are different mechanisms to evaluate a model depending on whether it is a classification or regression task. First, let's review the classification ones. Accuracy. Accuracy measures the degree to which the predictions are correct compared to all predictions made. Therefore, it results in computing the ratio between the number of accurate predictions divided by the total predictions 
for a given data sample. So accuracy is equal to accurate predictions divided by total predictions. While it intuitively makes sense and seems the most obvious choice for evaluating a model, there are situations where it may not be significant. Let's consider the following use case. We want to classify emails as spam. In the sample data, we have 99% of emails are legitimate, but 1% are labeled as spam. If I tell you I can easily build a model that gives us 99% accuracy, you would probably think that it would be a good result overall. Here is the model that would give us such a good accuracy. So, so yeah, so now when we feed a new email to this new model, our great 99% accurate model, um, we can, we can uh, get things that, that are always not spam. Um, so we don't, we don't have to evaluate a new email every time because our 99% our accurate model uh, will already know in advance that this is always never spam. Isn't it great? We can build a model that will always classify any email as not spam and still be 99% accurate. I guess you capture the f oh. Uh, I did not capture the fallacy of this approach, but the author assumes I did. So I guess you capture the fallacy of this approach. Accuracy gives you the big picture, but it needs to take into account that as part of that big picture, your data set may be highly imbalanced and may have more observations of one class than from the other. So this is, oh, I see. So I understand now. So the problem is in our in our data, 99% of the emails were legitimate, but only 1% were were spam. So you know, garbage in, garbage out with the data. The the model will will think that um, the model will be incorrect because it'll think too many emails are legitimate, depending on the data you use to train it. All right, so accuracy gives you the big picture, but it needs to take into account that as part of that big picture, your data set may be highly imbalanced and and may and have many more observations of one class than from another. This is a problem if we use a metric that cannot take that into account. In order to have a better view of the results, we need a better tool that allows us to identify to which degree the model is getting confused the confusion matrix. So confusion matrix, as the name suggests, this matrix will provide us insights into which cases the model is delivering the right conclusions and in which cases it is being confused. The confusion matrix is a two by two matrix that contains the following metrics by comparing the true values versus the predicted values. True positive, the cases where the true value was true and the predicted was also true. False positive, the, predict the model predicted true, but the actual value was false. This is referred to as a type one error. False negative, the model predicted false, but the actual value was true. This is referred to as a type two error. True negative, both the model prediction and the actual value are false. So here's the kinds of uh, results we can have. We can have a true positive, we can have a false positive, we can have a false negative, and we can have a true negative. So we have our predicted values and our actual values. So if our predicted value um, was uh, positive and the actual was positive, then we have a true, uh, a true positive. Uh, if our prediction was that it would be uh, negative, but actually it was negative, then we have a false negative. If our prediction was that it would be positive, but the actual is negative, 
then we have a false positive because our prediction was positive, but that turned out to be false, so it's a false positive. And then finally, if we predicted it to be negative and it actually is negative, now we have a true negative. In our example earlier, it would have many true positives, which is good. However, the confusion matrix would also also show a significant number of false negatives. All the cases where the email was spam, but our model statically classified it as not spam. In some instances like this, or for example, for cancer diagnosis, false negatives may have a significant impact. Therefore, we need to understand what metrics are more relevant to evaluate the model outcomes per use case. One of the confusion, out of the confusion matrix, there are a number of metrics that can be derived. Uh, the first metrics that can be derived out of the confusion matrix is precision, AKA positive predictive value, PPV. It helps identify the impact of false positives. It is computed as the ratio between the true positives divided by all the positives predicted by the model. If there are many false positives, the precision will be low. So here's the equation. I think I am going to plug this in the chat GPT. I don't have to plug everything in that chat GPT, but I'm just curious what it has to say about this. The formula you posted represents a calculation for the positive predictive value, PPV, which is a measure used in statistics, particularly in the context of diagnostic tests and binary classification systems. PPV defined, PPV is the proportion of positive results in statistics that are true positive results. It tells us how likely it is that a positive test result is a true positive, rather than false positive. Breaking down the components, TP, true positives, these are the instances where the test correctly identifies a positive case. For example, correctly identifying a diseased person is diseased. FP, false positives, these are the instances where the test incorrectly identifies a negative case is positive. For example, wrongly identifying a healthy person is diseased. Formula, PPV equals TPTP plus FPPPV equals BRAC TPTP plus fluorine monophosphate, PPV equals TP plus FPTP. Interpretation, the PPV gives the probability that given a positive test result, the case is truly positive. A higher PPV means that the test has a lower rate of false positives, which is particularly important in fields like medical diagnostics, where false positives can lead to unnecessary treatments or anxiety. Importance of PPV, PPV is especially useful when the costs of false positive are high. For instance, in medical testing, a false positive might lead to invasive follow-up tests or unnecessary treatment, which can be costly and potentially harmful. PPV can vary depending on the prevalence of the condition being tested for. As the prevalence decreases, the PPV generally decreases unless the test is exceptionally specific. This measure, along with others like sensitivity, specificity, and the negative predictive value, and PV, provides a comprehensive picture of a test's accuracy and usefulness in a given application. Okay, so I'm glad I fed it to that because that was some really good stuff. This is this is actually kind of profound. This is kind of having a impact on me because these are these are metrics um that you can derive based of a bait and and uh yeah so so the first one is the positive predictive value the pvv let's read about the next one recall which aka true positive rate tpr it helps identify to which extent the model can detect positive cases it is computed as the ratio between the true positives divided by the actual positives TP plus FN. If there are many false negatives, the recall will be lower. So let's see what this is. The formula you posted shows how to calculate the true positive rate, TPR, also commonly referred to as sensitivity recall. This is a crucial metric in statistics and machine learning, particularly in the context of classification problems and diagnostic testing. Formula breakdown. TPR equals TPTP plus FNX. TPR equals BRAC TPTP plus fluorine mononitride. TPR equals TP plus FNTP. TP, true positives. These are cases where the model or test correctly identifies a positive outcome. For example, detecting that a patient has a disease when they actually do oh. have it. FN, it? false negatives. These are cases where the model or test incorrectly identifies a positive outcome as negative. For example, not detecting a disease in a patient who does have the disease. Interpretation. The TPR measures the proportion of actual positives that are correctly identified by the test. It tells you how effective the tester model is at catching positive cases. A higher TPR means the tester model is more effective at identifying positive cases without missing them. Importance of TPR. Medical field. In medical diagnostics, a high TPR, high sensitivity, is crucial for ensuring that diseases are not missed by the test. 
For conditions where missing a diagnosis could be fatal or lead to severe complications, aiming for a high DPR is essential. Machine learning. In machine learning, particularly in balanced data sets where positive cases are rare, like fraud detection or rare disease diagnosis, TPR is an important measure to evaluate model performance. Complementary metrics. TPR is often used in conjunction with other metrics such as the false positive rate, FPR, positive predictive value, PPV, and specificity to provide a more complete picture of a test or model's performance. Sensitivity, TPR, and specificity together are commonly analyzed to understand the trade-offs between identifying true positives and avoiding false positives in different scenarios. In essence, TPR is a fundamental component of evaluating the accuracy and usefulness of a diagnostic test or classification model, ensuring that the positive cases are adequately captured. Okay, so that's uh, that looks good to me. Um, so what's the difference between this and this? They look exactly the same. Well, one thing I like to do is we're going to take a screenshot and we're going to put them side by side. And this bookmarks out of date. Okay, so now that they're side by side, which I have to shrink this down to make it really impactful. Okay, so they're directly side by side. So what is the difference? We can see the difference is the first part here, the, the PPV versus the TPTR. And we can see everything else is the same, except now we're taking the false negatives instead of the false positives for this last part. So we're adding up the total positives plus the false negatives. And then we're taking the total positives and we're dividing it by that sum. Um, to get the TPR, which stands for the uh, recall, the true positive rate. But if we want the precision, which is the positive predicted value, now we take the sum of the total positives plus the false positives, and then we take the total positives and divide it by that sum. Um, and that's different uh, because for, for, for this one, because the the term is here now we can kind of we can kind of imagine what the other ones would be right it'd be like the other uh combinations of that term right well i guess not <laughs> anyway uh that's the difference between the two it's kind of hard to see that so i definitely recommend anyone uh watching this uh uh go with this technique you know put things side by side like this with a with your screenshot tool and that can help identify what the difference is all right, so the next part is the F1 score. This is a synthetic metric result of combining precision and recall. The goal is to capture in a single metric the effect of both. So F1 equals two times uh, precision times recall divided by the sum of precision and uh, recall. F1 score will tend to amplify the impact of both low precision and recall values. F1 score ranges between 0 and 1. When data sets are imbalanced, it is essential to use the right metric to evaluate the model's performance. The biases on the data will always be learned by the model. The label imbalance is one of those biases, and the model will always tend to prefer the more frequent labels. That requires two strategies. The first one is use adequate evaluation metrics like those introduced above. Precision, recall, F1 score instead of accuracy. The second strategy to overcome the bias on the data that makes it okay so the second strategy to use the right metric to evaluate the data's performance is to try to balance your input data set. In addition to the transformations already reviewed throughout the book, such as scaling, normalization, dimensionality, reduction, sometimes you may need to implement strategies that will result in a more balanced ratio of classes. Suppose your data set has 90% of the observations from class A and 10% from class B. In that case, you may, number one, try to find more observations from class B 
Number two, undersample the observations from class A. Number three, oversample the classifications from class B. So this, this is starting to click for me now. Um, basically, we're, we're trying to deal with that problem where we're trying to make a prediction. For example, is this, is this image uh, of a dog or a cat? And we have unlimited pictures of dogs. We have millions and millions of pictures of dogs, but we only have like five pictures of cats. So, you know, that's going to be a problem. Your, your model's not going to be able to predict very accurately whether or not it's a cat. It's going to do a good job on if, it, if it's a dog because it has a lot of training data for that, but it will fail miserably to detect whether it's a cat. Um, so to so you know there's there's kind a lot of different ways to there's there's three main ways to address that the first one is get more pictures of cats <laughs> the second one is let's say that instead of five uh your model has uh a million of, of, of cats and and a hundred million of dogs well in that case you know how many pictures of cats and dogs do you really need you can undersample the observations from your pictures of dogs and just have a million uh, pictures each um, instead of 10. Yeah, so that, that would be a good uh, choice in that case where you have ample data for each of your uh, classifications. And then the final is, okay, well, there's something we don't have as high quality of data as as the cats uh there's something about the data of the pictures of the cats that's not quite as perfect for us as it is for the dogs so we can use just we can use fewer of the dogs because it's more high quality data and now we can use more data for the stuff where the data isn't quite as uh as uh airtight there are various techniques from the above that I will not explain. There is plenty of literature, but remember that a balanced data set is essential to achieve proper outcomes in any machine learning project. A strong bias towards a specific class or classes may produce misleading results. So here's a... Um, uh, All right, let's see what ChatGPT has to say about this. I can't even really read it. It's it's so hopefully ChatGPT can help with that because I can't even see it. And then we'll get the key takeaway, and that might be that might be it. I'm I'm definitely gonna do a hard break before neural networks because that's gonna be a big section. I want that to be started in its own video. Okay, so now something's happening where it won't uh, accept the input of this uh, picture. So I'll delete that picture. I'll do a control R uh, refresh to reset the cache, paste it in again and hit enter. There we go. The image you provided outlines a typical workflow in machine learning, ML, model development, highlighting several essential steps in the data pre-processing and model training process. Here's a breakdown of each step, input data set, X, Y. This is the starting point where you have your initial data set consisting of features, X, and labels or targets, Y. The data set might contain raw data collected from various sources. Data balancing, undersampling, oversampling, many real-world data sets are imbalanced, meaning some classes are represented more frequently than others. This can bias the model towards more frequent classes. To address this, techniques such as undersampling, removing samples from overrepresented classes, and oversampling, and more samples than underrepresented classes, are used to balance the data set. Dimensionality reduction, high-dimensional data, data with a large number of features, can lead to overfitting and high computational costs. Dimensionality reduction techniques like principal component analysis, PCA, or T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, TSNE, are used to reduce the number of features while attempting to retain the most relevant information. Scaling and normalization. Data scaling and normalization are critical pre-processing steps to ensure that all input features contribute equally to the model training, especially important in models that are sensitive to the scale of input data, such as SVMs and neural networks. Common methods include min-max scaling, standardization, mean removal and variance scaling, and normalization, scaling individual samples to the unit norm. Feature selection. This step involves selecting a subset of relevant features for use in model construction. It reduces the complexity of the model and can improve learning efficiency. Techniques can be based on statistical tests, feature importance obtained from ML models, or iterative methods like forward selection, backward elimination. ML model. This is the step where a machine learning algorithm is applied to the process data to train model. 
Algorithms can vary widely depending on the task, e.g., regression, classification, and include options like decision trees, support vector machines, neural networks, etc. Prediction, why, once the model is trained, it can be used to make predictions on new, unseen data. This output is what the model predicts based on the input features. This workflow encapsulates a robust approach to handling real-world data, transforming it into a format that machine learning models can effectively learn from, and finally deploying these models to make predictions or decisions based on new data. Each step is crucial for ensuring that the final model is accurate, generalizable, and efficient. All right, so we got one more part here, and then uh, the next section will be neural networks, and I want to have a hard break there and have that be part of its own video, because that's going to be uh, now decision trees we, we read, especially with that kind of algorithm, are perhaps equally as important, but kind of the buzzword, the flavor of the day is neural networks, so I want to give that its own space. But the key takeaway from this video is keep in mind that when we choose a metric to measure model performance, we must consider the balancing of the different classes and what is really more important for your use case. For some cases, false positives are more critical than false negatives. So neural networks is the big one. So that's the end of this video. And uh, this will have its own uh, uh, video here. So stay tuned for the, the big one, uh, which is neural networks.